Thank you. Thanks, it's, it's a pleasure to be back and to be in this nice facility. I gave uh, trauma rounds last time. They don't have quite as nice space as you cancer guys, I notice. So. Uh, well, you know, Andrew asked me, I didn't know you were into this. Is this a new line of work? And actually, it's not, and I think I should explain it. <clears throat> when I was a fellow working with Jack Mackinich, it was in the time, the heyday of penile augmentation surgery. And so I was working in San Francisco, and my fellowship director said, I need you to measure a lot of men's penises and get normal sizes so that we can counteract the, the myths that men need these penile enlargement surgeries. So I spent a lot of time working with Tom Liu, a, a luminary in the field of erectile dysfunction research. And I thought to myself while I was starting this project and writing the IRB, I said, this is the stupidest thing I'm ever going to do. But in fact, of course, it was the thing that got me more press in my career as a researcher than anything I've done. And Men's Health magazine still routinely contacts me about, now what's normal and what are the parameters around all this? And, and if you are a reader of that august journal, you'll see my name cited. But uh, that doesn't go into my promotion packet. I sort of keep that uh, under wraps. So I got to the University of Arizona for my first job, and I had all these uh, great ideas about doing wound healing research. And this dermatologist walked into my office and said, can you measure erections? And I said, well, sure. Uh, why would you want to do that? And it turns out they had developed a peptide compound that promoted skin tanning, but its unexpected side effect was to promote erection. Uh, through a central pathway. So I did some early studies with them, and that got me further into the erectile dysfunction arena. And then finally, when I started coalescing more of a research focus, you go where the money is. And the money is in diabetes. And the National Institutes of Health promote research in diabetic studies because it's important. It affects a lot of men, and uh, it's considered important public health. So here's a slide. This is the guy with his walker and his bazooka, and his wife is saying, for crying out loud, Edgar, the FDA is not going to recall your Viagra. You know, this is from back in 1998, when Pfizer first came out. But the point of this slide is that men are increasingly seeking to preserve sexual function and quality of life as they age. And if all men in the US with ED were to receive treatment, it would cost $10 billion a year. So clearly, we need to think differently about how we're going to deal with erectile dysfunction. If we can't preserve wellness early in life, we'll never be able to afford the costs of it. So the next slide here is actually a list. Some of you may know Bill Steers, William Steers. He's the chair at Virginia, a very uh, smart man. And he came up and was a visiting professor in, in Washington a few years ago. And I said, Bill, what, should, what are the things that you think are important in diabetes erectile dysfunction? And this was his list. And it's actually so served as a roadmap for me uh, to try and work on different aspects of this. So this will be our outline for the, for the talk. What's the true incidence and prevalence? What type of dysfunction is associated with diabetes? A little bit about animal models, pathogenesis. And then a key question, is diabetic control related to ED? And finally, is there a role for he said chemo prevention, but I think prevention more generally is the, is the question that I'd have. So first of all, some statistics. You all know that diabetes is, is an epidemic, as they say. The prevalence is increasing worldwide, and it's affecting 12% of US adults over the age of 40. What's interesting is that type 1 diabetes is not increasing in incidence. Uh, what we're seeing is a lifetime risk at 1.3%, but they're coming up earlier and earlier. So typically, you'd think of a teenager or a young adult developing ID, uh, type 1 diabetes. Now it's happening in childhood. I have a niece who developed it when she was five. And there are even cases I've heard in Sweden of children within the first year of life that are developing type 1 diabetes. And it's a, it's a genetic issue, so uh, it's a susceptible population. But then there's the environmental impact on genes. And it's thought that the accelerators are puberty, growth in general, obesity, insulin resistance. So an interesting hypothesis some of you may have heard about is this hygiene hypothesis that, that actually the studies are based on the, the border area between Finland and Russia. And the genetic population on both sides of the border is very similar. 
On the Finnish side, there's a higher, significantly higher rate of type 1 diabetes than on the Russian side. And there's this hypothesis, hygiene hypothesis, that in an overly sterile environment where there aren't enough environmental sort of um, antigens and things stimulating the immune system, that that lack of stimulus may lead to a higher susceptibility to, to diabetes. And that, that's one of the areas where they've been testing that hypothesis in populations. Now, type 2 is the big ticket item in terms of prevalence. And we might be able to do a study between Canada and the U.S., huh? Because, uh, you know, it's definitely cleaner up here. We're a little sort of dirtier, messier, fatter. And uh, I don't know about the genetics, though. I don't know if we're similar enough. I think, I think probably a lot of Norwegians down in, uh, in Seattle. I don't know if there are many of those up here. Anyway, type 2 diabetes is, is where most of the prevalence is. And I've always studied type 1 <coughs> issues because that's where I thought the money is. But the money is shifting a little bit because it's now, even compared to 10 years ago, the, 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 the focus is on type 2 much more. Teenage onset is something we're seeing more of. And the, the hallmark is insulin resistance. And they develop the metabolic syndrome. What you should know is that the neuropathy and other complications are prevalent. You think of type 2 as maybe being a more benign course. And it's not. It just uh, presents itself differently. These are the risk factors for erectile dysfunction in a national population-based study called NHANES. It's a study of health, nutrition, and, and exercise. But in 2001, I think, we got a single question on the NHANES survey on ED. And interestingly, it was actually funded by the PD-5 manufacturers, but the data was was provided to, to NIH investigators. Diabetes is the thing that causes the greatest increase in risk of any of the comorbidities for erectile dysfunction. You can see BMI comes in there uh, as a significant factor. So does hypertension and current smoking. The reason heart disease doesn't is only because uh, these other things like obesity and hypertension and smoking and diabetes all cause heart disease and are associated with it. So when you take them out of the model, uh, you'd see a difference. And this is a summary slide of the different prevalences of the urologic complications. You can see that urinary incontinence is pretty prevalent in women with diabetes. And for men, erectile dysfunction is the biggest problem. But there's also significant uh, problems with orgasmic dysfunction and low desire. And this is data from the literature. So again, we come back to this question, why is this, is this important? And I get this all the time because it's not heart disease. They aren't dying of it. It's not prostate cancer. So should we be studying this? Should, shouldn't you just give all these people Viagra? And you even hear that from people on the study section, people reviewing your grants and things like that. So I think it's a reasonable question. And I guess to try and get at that a little bit, this is a slide looking at perceived value of health. That's where a patient can uh, rate their health status from uh, a maximum of one, so one would be complete best health. Zero is death. And then actually you can have negative numbers. I mean, there's some conditions that are worse than living. Uh, but if you look at these scores, there, there are reductions in uh, how patients perceive the value of their life based on their urologic complications. Uh, you can take the SF36 score and create a utility index and, and so this is hopefully a way that we can get towards issues of uh, public health impact. You can probably start calculating the cost it would take or how much it costs to improve health. And you can see that erectile dysfunction significantly reduces this. These are statistically significant, but if you, if you look at the numbers, these are, you know, about a half standard deviation difference. So they're probably clinically relevant as well. But uh, to get a little bit more accurate data on the prevalence of these sexual dysfunctions, uh, we started a study that's an ancillary study to a large randomized controlled trial of men and women with type 1 diabetes called EDIC. And I'll describe the study to you a little bit. Another uh, urology researcher and I uh, are involved in this study. And so, <clears throat> does anyone have a pointer by any chance? Well, I can just walk you through it. Okay. 
Okay. So, so the DCCT was called the Diabetes Control and Complications Trial. It was a randomized controlled trial of men and children and women and girls uh, who had early type 1 diabetes. And it was started back in the 1980s. And at that time, they were randomized to either uh, intensive therapy, which is like four times a day insulin or else a glucose, an insulin pump, versus the more conventional treatment, which at the time was just twice a day insulin. And so they were on that for about seven years average. And then the study closed because it proved conclusively that there was a lower rate of neuropathy, nephropathy, and retinopathy. So the major diabetes complications all were reduced in, uh, in incidence in this, in this cohort. But the interesting thing is that they, uh, they didn't close the trial out. They continued to follow this group in an observational basis in something called EDIC, the Epidemia of Diabetes Intervention and Complications. And these patients have been studied now for going on 17 years up to 2010. And in 2003, we got involved and were able to do a urologic phenotype of the group. And then we've, we now are funded to follow them and continue to get more information. So this is a really valuable cohort because they're very well described. They have reasonably good control. And we know everything there is to know about them, all their complications, their glucose control, and, and, and the like. And so what we've done is uh, in year 10 and again in year 17, we've administered the IIEF or the Female Sexual Function Index. We've given the AUA Symptom Index and uh, some urinary incontinence validated questionnaires. We're now getting hormonal assays uh, and we're getting them to look at testosterone and look about hypogonadism. We're also getting PSA to learn a little bit about prostate growth and uh, the effects of diabetes on prostate growth. And, uh, we may, may learn information that would be interesting related to cancer as well in that regard. And then we're looking at some health-related quality of life issues like their um, quality of life scores, SF36, some diabetes-specific ones, and, and the EQ5D, which is a health utilities uh, battery of five questions that some of you are probably familiar with. So here's what we, we learned. In 2003, when we queried these men, you know, the IIEF actually depends on sexual activity in the last four weeks. It says, in the last four weeks. And there's a, there's a question that says, no intercourse. So if you're using that instrument, you need to make sure whether you want them to have that option or not. And a lot of people don't include that no intercourse option because it gives you a zero score, and then you can't really score the, the instrument. But if you look at this, uh, this is just a histogram showing the different responses of the 450 people who had been sexually active in the last four weeks. And you can see that there's a big spread. There are a lot of people with erectile dysfunction over here. <coughs> but you can also see there's just a huge number of people that have perfectly normal erectile function. The vast majority of the men have completely normal erections. And their average age is 44 here. Uh, but they've had diabetes for 20 years by now. And so it's, it's interesting. And we're studying the abnormal patients down here, but I think there's actually a lot that could be done studying those supernormal people. Like, why don't they have any problems? And what is it about their makeup, either their glycemic control or their genetic makeup, that might protect them? Well, it's interesting that there were 128 men who were not sexually active. And we worked around this because there was a question that said, how would you rate your confidence that you can get or keep an erection? And so that wasn't dependent on being sexually active. And when you looked at that group of 128, well, half of them uh, had the erectile dysfunction. So to answer Bill's question, you know, what is the prevalence and what is the, the types of sexual dysfunctions? Well, here's the answer. So in this cohort of men who are 44 years old, the prevalence was 23%, which is about three times what you'd expect in the normal population at this age. Uh, the level of low sexual desire was quite high. That was surprisingly high, 33%. And so we can go back and get their testosterone data from, from this point in 2003, and we'll repeat the study again now. So I think we'll get some interesting information there. Type 1 diabetes is thought to have a low prevalence of hypogonadism. It's the type 2s that, that are thought to have more centrally mediated uh, dysfunctions in their testosterone and androgens. So that'll be an interesting avenue of investigation. And then it was, it was 
surprising how few men had orgasmic dysfunction. And that's something we haven't really studied very much. Again, I mean, if I said, where's the, where's the money here? It's clearly not, I don't think we're going to get much um, impact from studying that. Is that average age still 44? Well, at this, at this assay, at this, excuse me, at this, um, in, it is. So we'll have 10-year follow-up data. So this is, in fact, just prevalence because it's cross-sectional. But in our 2010 um, query, which we're doing right now, we'll get the follow-up. So of these 92, this will be the interesting part of the study. For all these people over here, we'll be able to get instance. You know, what is the, how many new cases of dysfunction are there? And, and then you can get more at some of the causal issues that, that we're interested in which we couldn't really do on this initial study. And I think this is a good example for those of you who are starting out your research careers. In 2003, we had the NIH paid some money to get the data, but they gave us no money. So for seven years, we, we worked on this basically as an unfunded mandate. But we got the data, we published the papers, we kept at it, and then we got a five-year, 500,000 a year grant to study this. So, you know, looking for those opportunities to, to get data. The data is the most valuable thing. So if you can find it, especially data that's really high quality from a really big cohort. And they won't give you too much money to do that first go round. But if you can get them to analyze the data or if you can do it in-house, uh, you can then leverage it. So I've, I've looked at the first two questions up there, and I'm going to spend a little time talking about animal models and animal research, because I, I think it, it helps inform us about what to do next in the humans. And so I, I want to give you a couple examples of what we did in the lab and why I think it has value, even though I'm not doing laboratory-based research anymore. And so this is uh, a list of sort of the main proposed mechanisms of diabetes-associated erectile dysfunction. I don't think any of this will be on the in-service or, or on a board exam, but it, it is important when we think about treatments. So the main, the main hypotheses are the tissue fibrosis hypothesis, and TGF-beta is invoked always when you ever hear about fibrosis. But the other main fibrotic pathway that people are investigating is through the sonic hedgehog pathway, and there's a group at Northwestern that's been studying it, and this is a morphogenic protein, and actually the group at Northwestern is using some nanoparticle delivery to deliver sonic protein back into the penis of animals and, you know, using some very innovative techniques to try and uh, see whether this could be a, a, a viable therapeutic option. The, the nitric oxide pathway is obviously very well uh, delineated, and one of the main mechanisms is probably nitrogenic nerve degeneration. That so the the non adrenergic, non cholinergic nerves that lead to the penis uh, degenerate in a two step process in diabetes. The first one is reversible, and the second phase is irreversible. And one of the things that I think would be interesting would be to think about when does a man become irreversible. Uh, that's something that we might be able to study over the years in our population. Can people go in and out of state of diabetic erectile dysfunction? Can they, if, they, if their glycemic control worsens, can, can they uh, actually improve their glycemic control and then reverse their erectile dysfunction? Uh, we don't have the fine detail on that that we need. And then the Rho pathway is, the Rho kinase is a calcium sensitizing agent that causes exaggerated contractile responses. And there are some Rho inhibitors that, when applied topically, can lead to uh, improvements in erectile function, but they haven't really made it to the clinic. And I think one of the challenges in this field is actually that it's almost impossible to get a new drug approved in ED because the bar is so high. You have to be as good or better than a PDE5 inhibitor, and you have to be so safe you know, the, the FDA really won't approve anything with any sort of risk profile at all. They won't even let it go forward. The nasal spray that we were looking into that was based on that skin tanning agent, it 
actually caused a one or two millimeter increase in systolic blood pressure in a phase two trial. And that was enough to just pull the plug. Uh, that, that drug is never going to make it to market. So. And then I think the big underlying theme is oxidative stress being uh, one of the ways that all of this takes place. So this is just a, uh, a graph, a summative graph of the intracavernosal pressures of rats that either controls in the boxes or diabetic in the triangles that are stimulated with a nerve stimulator and the pressure in their cavernosum is, is, is measured. This is the classic way of measuring in the laboratory erectile dysfunction. And you can see that streptozytosin, STZ, is a toxin to islet cells that knocks them off. And it's an old model for diabetes. And we used it, and we got some criticism for using it because, oh, well, there's a bio, there's a bio breeding rat that's a genetic model of type 1 diabetes, and well, why don't you use that one? And so five, seven years ago, we were getting criticized for that. But now that all the mouse models are out here, streptozytosin is suddenly looking really good again because you can take your knockout model or your overexpression model and you can easily make them di uh, diabetic. So we can measure erectile dysfunction and we can induce diabetes. And we did this and we took the tissue from the animals and we, we did some microarray studies, of course. That's what you do when you don't really know what to do. You do some microarray studies. And so we took uh, rat gene chips and, and looked for changes in mRNA expression between the the diabetes and the uh, control animals. And so these are the controls here, and the, these are the uh, STZ animals over here, and these are the genes most highly differentially expressed. And it's just a list, and you have to make, you have to make something out of it. But uh, I'll, I'll tell you just one story about it. So you start with 15,000 genes, and then you use a number of statistical analyses, and you apply the cutoffs to try and <clears throat> avoid finding insignificant genes. And then you can use a number of strategies to, to try and understand whether they're significant or not. Uh, and we, we did literature mining where you sort of, you basically take your list of genes and then you put in some keywords like you would in a PubMed search. And if you put in like vascular and uh, endothelium, then it'll just sort out your list. So here's our list sorted out <clears throat> based on, on our pub matrix. And I'd like to point out somewhere up at the top, the, the third one down is ceruloplasmin. So then you have to look at this list and say, well, what does it mean? And, and go into the literature further. And this is what fellows are good for uh, because it takes years to, to get through all this. But uh, Chris Sullivan in my lab did, and he found out that ceruloplasmin actually is an interesting molecule. It has to do with copper homeostasis, but some Italian studies showed that it impairs aortic uh, endothelium-dependent relaxation of smooth muscle, and it inhibits nitric oxide synthase and NO production. And so it seemed like a logical target to follow up further and understand, is this involved in diabetes? So the first thing we did was just look at it in human tissue, and sure enough, so this is a corpus cavernosum here. This is a Sinusoid, this is the endothelium, this is, well, this is endothelium right along the edge, this is the smooth muscle bundles, and this is collagen out here. And you can see from the various staining that it stained both the smooth muscle and the endothelium in human specimens. So this is one of the ideas I actually got from, from coming up here years ago and working and visiting Larry. You guys, you do your intervention, you do a prostate biopsy, then you take the prostate out. And so when I do a penile implant, I take tissue out so I have human tissue. But I've also been trying to develop this as a, a way of sort of a laboratory. You know, a month before a penile implant, do an intervention, get a baseline biopsy of the penis, and then when you do the implant, you can take the tissue out just like you guys take out your prostate and see well, what does that affect. Uh, so I hope to use those translational approaches in, in this kind of research more. So we developed a hypothesis, really, that, well, in diabetes, <clears throat> ceruloplasmin may act to increase oxidative stress and lead to erectile dysfunction. So in a wild-type mouse, 
over here, if you render them diabetic with streptozytosin, you'd expect to see an increase in penile ceruloplasmin, reduction in NOS activity, and impaired erectile function. And in fact, we, we do see all these things, but that's not a cause and effect relationship. But then you can take a knockout mouse that lacks ceruloplasmin and you make them diabetic with, with the streptozytosin. And then, if our hypothesis is correct, you should have intact vasculogenic erectile function. So here's where that streptozytosin comes back in. It's much easier to do this than to breed a, a CP knockout mouse with some sort of um, non-obese diabetic mouse model and do all that breeding. We just inject them with the streptozytosin. So what we found, first of all, we got the and this is, uh, we got the knockout mice from uh, an investigator in, at Hopkins, and you can see that in the knockout mice, there is no ceruloplasmin uh, on Western blotting, and you don't see any uh, immunohistochemical staining of it in the cavernosum of the mouse, uh, whereas you do in the wild type, and you see a reduction in, in the heterozygote. The next thing we did was to make sure that the knockout mouse, that, well, we thought that maybe the knockout mouse itself would have better erectile function just based on maybe if you take away the CP, there'll be more bioavailable nitric oxide sitting around and so that it will actually have better function. And it didn't. And we were disappointed, but then we read the literature a little bit more and CP is actually a moonlighting protein in that depending on what its environment is, it can switch its function. So in a normal environment, it may actually have a an antioxidant type function and actually be good, but then when you put it into the oxidative environment, it actually can become a pro-oxidant and make things much worse. So we initially thought, well, this was discouraging, but then we rendered the animals diabetic, and you can see that <clears throat> here are just some glucose levels. Uh, these are not fasted, so they're a little bit higher than if you were fasting them. But in the, in the STZ animals, both the wild type and the knockout mice developed diabetes and had fairly significant level of hyperglycemia. So it didn't seem to change the ability to make the animals hyperglycemic or induce diabetes. And then this is the key experiment. And what this is a graph of, of endothelial relaxation, uh, endothelial dependent relaxation in response to acetylcholine. And so you can see in the... Uh, in the control animals that were not, uh, excuse me, let me explain this. So these are the streptozytosin animals that were wild type or ceruloplasmin, and these are, so let me just explain it this way. <laughs> this is a diabetic animal that has an impaired relaxation to uh, acetylcholine, and you'd have to take my word for it. And the further you are over on the right, the worse is the, you need higher doses of acetylcholine to induce relaxation. And what you can see is in the knockout mouse, there's a, there is a protective effect. The curve is shifted to the left. There's improved relaxation at any given dose of acetylcholine. And what this does is sort of bring the animal back more towards what a non-diabetic animal would look like. So this was further evidence that ceruloplasmin was playing some role in the pathogenesis of diabetic uh, erectile dysfunction, at least in mice. So this was pretty exciting. Now, the, the, the concept behind this is that, well, this may have something to do with copper, and can copper actually participate in the oxidative environment and in conjunction with ceruloplasmin cause oxidative stress? So <clears throat> we actually then did a chelator experiment in mice where we rendered them uh, hyperglycemic with streptozytosin. And then we either injected vehicle or TTM, which is a copper chelator that's approved by the FDA for use for Wilson's disease where there's copper uh, excesses. And so we treated them for 42 days with the, with the chelator or with the vehicle. And uh, it reduces copper levels. And by definition, it also reduces ceruloplasmin. That's sort of one of the net effects of these chelators. And so uh, this, is the, this is the tracing from the, the, the experiment. Again, you can see, like in the vehicle STZ, they have endothelial dysfunction. And you can see, again, the chelator moves the curve to the left, similar to what uh, happened with the knockout mice. So are we ready to go into human studies with this? Uh, I don't think so. But here's a translational avenue that's been opened up.
by this. These are FDA approved. It might, it might be feasible to do a small pilot study uh, of a few men with diabetes. And uh, this is the kind of thing that we could do in our, in our clinical research center at UW uh, or something like that. So let's get back to the human. So because really, should the next step be doing the chelator studies or should we just be focusing more on glycemic control and the simple things that are easier to do? And that comes back to this question is, is diabetes control related to erectile dysfunction? And so there have been a few studies in the past showing an association, worse control, more erectile dysfunction. But we actually took that population who had been randomized and we looked at them and uh, what we found, this is the, the key study. So in our study, the EDICT study, of course, age was associated with erectile dysfunction. So age is a big factor. For every year of age, there's an increased risk of erectile dysfunction. The duration of their diabetes prior to entry into the study made no difference to their risk of uh, long-term erectile function. Their baseline hemoglobin A1C, the higher it was, yes, it affected risk of ED. But here's the interesting one. If they were in the intensive control group, there was uh, you know, a significant reduction in the odds ratio of erectile dysfunction. So this is randomized controlled trial data used to test the hypothesis that uh, intensive control can reduce the risk of, of erectile dysfunction. And actually, this, this is pretty strong evidence. So we were, so this slide tells you a couple things. Age is always gonna be important. And secondly, that hemoglobin, you know, Hemoglobin A1C is important, both at the time you come in, but then with intensive control, you can reduce the risk of erectile dysfunction. Now, this is going to come out in the journal in, uh, in April. So we actually tried to get it into a different journal, the Annals of Internal Medicine. And uh, their review, their review of our um, paper was longer than the paper itself. And our response to the paper was 39 pages long the response to the reviewers. And we had like three iterations of responses. It took two years and then they rejected us. So I'm never gonna submit to the Annals of Internal Medicine again. But they have full-time statisticians. It's probably like some of the cancer journals, uh, you know, very serious stats uh, issues here. Uh, this wasn't, so this is a graph just showing the, the uh, increasing prevalence of ED a different question, but over every year in edict, in the intensive and the conventional group. And while you can see that there's a reduction in risk, you can also see that every year the rate's going up. So we aren't going to prevent erectile dysfunction with this. We're going to maybe delay it. Uh, and with intensive glycemic control, we may delay the onset. But I don't think we're ever going to get it down to zero. And it gets back to this issue of risk and preventive fa protective factors. And it turns out there's an epidemiologist at the University of Washington who's been studying genetic factors in erectile dysfunction. So Jack Goldberg used a Vietnam-era twin registry to show that you know, the monozygotic twins have a higher association of ED between the siblings than, than the dizygotic twins. So there is a heritability factor related to erectile dysfunction. And <clears throat> Uh, so we're starting to work with Jack a little bit to think about this. And so the obvious issue is, well, are there genes that are controlling erectile dysfunction risk in diabetes that we can, can look at? And, and there's some stuff out there about gene polymorphisms associated with other diabetes complications. PPAR gamma has been protective against nephropathy. And there are other things that increase risk of nephropathy and neuropathy. But really very little about erectile dysfunction. There's one paper that looked at ENOS polymorphisms with a very small cohort of patients using a, a PCR-based approach. So there are some leads suggestive of this. And it, again, it gets back to this issue of the inexorable rise in, in risk of ED no matter which side of the, uh, the study you were in. So we have data showing that if you intensively control glucose, you can, you can you can at least reduce the risk of ED. So that's new data. How would we use it? I mean, people are already using intensive glycemic control in diabetes. But maybe in type 2, it needs to be addressed more fully. 
And there's a paper from some folks at Brown that just started looking at that. There, they uh, did a cardiovascular risk reduction strategy in a group of veterans in the VA population in, in Providence, Rhode Island, who had type 2 diabetes. And what this box plot shows that if you were in the, if your hemoglobin A1C was greater than 7 during this short period of intervention, your IAEF score got a little bit worse. It went down a little bit. But if you were in the better control group, the next box over here, if you had um, lower A1C and improvement, your IAEF score actually went up a little bit. Likewise, if your blood pressure was only controlled to the 130 over 80 range, your IAEF score went down a little bit. And this one it went up. You can see the error bars are huge. But it's intriguing that uh, in type 2, some of the same interventions may have a beneficial effect. And we've started looking at blood pressure in the type 1 patients because we think that may be another pathway by which diabetes is mediating erectile dysfunction. So sort of closing, I'd like to think a little bit about is there a role for prevention? And we can't prevent erectile dysfunction with the glycemic control. No matter how tight we make it, they're, they're still going to develop ED. And this is a slide from the NIH about the future of, of medicine as we think it predictive, personalized, preemptive. And Lee Hood has a fourth one, which is participatory, that this kind of information will allow patients to be able to participate more if they understand their genetic and other factors that are influencing health, they may be able to become more engaged in their own health and wellness and, and participate early. So if we go back to this model and say, we've got uh, intensive control, all these things are the main factors that we, we use to assess ED risk. These are the main things that that we can understand about ED risk. But even when you control for all of that, there's a lot of unexplained variation. There's a significant amount of unexplained ED. In fact, all those things on that slide only explain 11% of the variation in ED amongst the diabetic patients in our cohort. So there are other things that are causing this. And it's back to this question of could it be due to genetic factors. So we're looking at the environment. That's glucose control, that's body weight, that's exercise, that's all those other things. What about the, the, the genome? And again, this twin study is the one that showed these heritability factors suggesting that 29 to 36 percent of ED is explained by genetics. And that's the, probably the same amount of uh, heritability that we see with things like nephropathy, uh, because there's definitely genes associated with the risk of nephropathy. So our hypothesis is that genetic factors could play an important role in the susceptibility of, to ED in type 1 diabetes and that common alleles could be identified. And the goal would be to predict, so you have 100 men with diabetes and you know that 40 of them are going to develop ED. Can you identify them early, make sure they get intensive control, maybe put them on some sort of um, antioxidant program or something like that, and make sure that they are in all other respects controlled, that their blood pressure's ideally controlled, that their body weight is, that you really tell them. It gets to the question, if you told someone 20 years ahead of time that they could avoid something, would they change their behaviors? You know, that's, that's a, an unknown question and, you know, I think it gets into the issues of male health and are men able to participate and effectively um, focus on wellness. But, I think if you got a readout and made it very digital and quantitative, at least all those Boeing engineers and Microsoft engineers would probably be, they'd be tracking their numbers on a, on a dashboard. So we sort of took a two-stage case control approach to test this. You know, one is the candidate approach where you take your list of genes and you look for them. Are there uh, variations in the genome based on, on a, a priori selection of candidates? And then the other is the, the unbiased genome-wide approach, which I'm sure uh, you guys use here as well. And so the way we developed our candidate list was through those rat studies that I alluded to earlier, and then also we did some human studies where we were looking at different endothelial cell types from coronary arteries, umbilical veins, 
and from the corpus cavernosum, we isolated these endothelial cells and we looked at what genes specifically localized to human cavernosal endothelium. So again, we got a list like this, and we used this list to generate our candidate approach. These were some genes that we said a priori we think might be uh, associated with erectile dysfunction. And not surprisingly, it was a negative study. Uh, and I think it points out the fact that, you know, these candidate approaches are a challenge. It's, it's very unlikely you're going to find anything. And the existing ways we have of looking for, for new candidates are laborious and slow. And so the fact that we got a negative study really is just supporting evidence that we need to take other approaches, you know, which is the genome-wide approach where you take some sort of platform, in our case, an Illumina HapMap uh, assay <clears throat> where you look for a million SNPs based on linkage disequilibrium. And so our cases and controls were from the Euroedic population, these diabetic patients, based on the 2003 phenotype, mean age 49. They're almost all white, so, you know, the, the genetic issues related to race are less important. They're extremely well characterized, and there's reliable data and phenotypes. So this is an, a QQ plot looking at observed to expected um, association of SNPs, and you can see there are very few that are off of the line. If you look at it in a different way, you can see this is all one million uh, SNPs from the 26 chromosomes. And uh, you see there are just a few dots up above the red line and the blue line. Those are getting towards 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 7. So again, really 10 to the minus 8 is the cutoff you'd want to see. So we had a few top hits, and you can see where they were. None of them were quite significant. Uh, this one Alcam is interesting. It's an, uh, a leukocyte cell adhesion molecule that associates leukocytes with endothelial cells and is thought to perhaps mediate some of the cardiovascular inflammation uh, and things that happen in atherosclerosis. And uh, it, we think there's some biological plausibility to follow that further in, in our own systems here. Uh, one of the problems with our phenotype is it's based on a cross-sectional measure. And in the same group, we actually have data. There was a single question asked every year, do you have impotence, yes or no? And, you know, the, the journals would blow you out of the water if you tried to submit an article with that as your definition of ED. But if you have it for 20 straight years, um, you can then define a phenotype not based on the IAEF score, but it's years until they develop impotence. And that, that sort of longitudinal continuous variable may give us a better phenotype and may actually be able to, to sort of tease out whether there's some of these really meet a more stringent significance. So ultimately, I could envision a future where we uh, do intervention studies with that chelator or something like that, but we base it on, on high-risk studies. So these would be men in their 40s, maybe those whose hemoglobin A1Cs are running a percentage point above normal. We, we do, we look for their genetic susceptibility and then we might apply one of these interventions here, whether it's more intensive control or PDE5 inhibitors, chelators, or even just some of the lifestyle interventions that make a difference. So I'm, I'm concluding here by, by saying that we're very far on the left here. We'd like to look at this not only in ED but in some of the other disorders that are important in diabetes, urinary incontinence in women. Uh, UTI issues, and uh, we have a number of different groups at the University of Washington that can help us do this. Uh, we need replication cohorts, and that's where it gets really expensive. And I was just talking to a program officer at the NIH. A lot of these studies have failed. They're very expensive, but if you know where genotyping is already taking place, you can assemble them that way. And there's a group in Finland that's genotyped several thousand patients with type 1 diabetes in the uh, Finn Diane study, Finnish diabetic nephropathy study. So if we can get one single question onto their next annual um, survey, we could then suddenly have a, a huge cohort. Or we're using another strategy where we're using the EMR and prescription data to develop our phenotype. So 
if someone has a diagnosis of ED in their EMR or they've been given a prescription for a PDE5 inhibitor, we think that's a pretty good way to identify your cases. So I'd like to conclude by acknowledging some of the people who've, who've worked with me and, and helped uh, support this and, and say that this is more speculative about where this would go, but I, I think that we will have more data about the severity of this disease. We're sort of approaching it from three ways. Economic burden of disease, so we're doing economic studies with uh, data from the I3 database. It's the Ingenix database from uh, insurers' data. So how much does it cost to treat diabetic erectile dysfunction? What's the differential cost? So we might calculate the expected total national cost uh, related to diabetic ED. And if we had that number roughed out, we could then go to a, a funding agency and say, look, whether you know it or not, you're going to be spending X million dollars a year. So invest $500,000 in, in some prevention research study. So we're doing that sort of analysis. We're doing the genetic work, and we're going to try and continue to see what environmental factors influence it. So hopefully this will be something. I like this because I think it will be something that will sustain my research career. So after I get tossed aside as the chair, I'll still have something to do afterwards. So thank you very much.